cold summer snow When it falls on you, your blood runs cold But don't you sweat your pretty skin Cause it melts away for it sinks in And you dream about this very night All the furniture and most of the tools in my woodworking shop are on wheels this allows me to clear out space for big projects, corporate retreats, classes, and social gatherings. A side benefit is that it converts instantly into a movie theater. About once a week or so, we push the work tables aside, then we pull out the sofas, the soft chairs, and the end tables. We dim the lights and lower the screen and watch a movie. Sometimes we stream them from the net, but I prefer the discs in my Blu-ray collection. Things have been challenging the last couple of months because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But for the last six or seven years, we invite friends, family, and neighbors to join us. I always make a big bowl of hot buttered popcorn. Some of the regulars come more for the popcorn than for the movie. My workshop has good bright lighting for making things and some very dim hanging lamps that help people maintain their night vision before the movie starts. But the popcorn table doesn't have a light to popcorn by. I jury-rigged a light with a cheap clamp-on fixture. A few weeks ago, that light bulb burned out and I was faced with an opportunity. I sat down on my computer, brought up SketchUp, and proceeded to design a lamp that could hang over the popcorn table and shed some light on the popping issue. As soon as I started drawing, I realized that this project was a fine candidate for diverging from the normal. A candidate for getting goofy. The lamp was going to be used only for fun, so why not design it to look that way? With a swooping spine, arching ribs, flaring valences, and metabolist hanging tackle. And colorful too. I'll paint it in colors I don't normally use in the shop. It'll be just the thing for the monkey movie theater. I made the whole thing out of a nice quality Russian birch plywood that I buy from a wood dealer in Santa Rosa. I probably don't need to, but I first cut each piece a little bit too big and I flip it around and trim the opposite edge to the final exact width. This assures me two perfectly straight, square, and clean edges. I do this on all sides of all the pieces. The first piece I cut was the central spine from three quarter inch plywood. Then I cut four identical rectangles of half inch plywood for the ribs. The rest of the parts will be made from quarter inch ply. Using double-sided tape, I stuck the four ribs together and then laid out the cut lines on the top board. Now, I enjoy layout work, so doing this didn't bother me, but in retrospect, I should have just printed the plans out in actual size and then simply pasted them to the plywood as a cutting guide instead of having to transfer all the dimensions by hand. For the swooping curves, I just bent a thin, straight-grained offcut between the two ends and the apex of the curve, and I traced the resulting parabola. It's quick and easy. This is going to be a good enough project. Normally, I'm kind of a perfectionist in my woodworking. This is usually a good thing, but not always. It's easy for me to sweat the details on a project and try to make every little part perfect. This popcorn lamp project had no need for perfection. In fact, perfection would detract from its lighthearted look. Working to a standard of good enough is more difficult for me and takes more conscious effort, but it can be a lot of fun and very rewarding when things come together quickly. Now, the layout all looked pretty straightforward, but it turned out that some of the cuts I had planned were impossible to make, so we improvised. I took a facing cut on the stack of ribs to make sure they would lay flat on the table saw when I cut them. 
I changed out my multi-purpose blade for my dado, intending to use it to cut the lap joints that would hold the whole lamp together. After mounting the dado blade, I realized that being only eight inches in diameter, it just wasn't big enough to make the cuts I needed. Huh. I love my saw stop table saw. It's a real solid workhorse and I'm pleased to have its flesh detecting circuitry on duty to protect my fingers. But swapping blades on the saw stop means also swapping brake cartridges. It's a minor hassle, but necessary. Most of the tools in the wood shop are only dangerous if you purposefully, intentionally do something really dunderheaded. But the table saw will bite you if you're merely careless or cavalier about using it. In all other saws, the blade descends into the work against a backstop, making them inherently safe. The round blade of the table saw does that too, but it also rises out of the table into the bottom of the workpiece. A moment's inattention can cause disaster. The rising blade can fling that workpiece at your head at 100 miles an hour while simultaneously sucking your precious fingers into its spinning carbide teeth. If you want to keep all your digits, you'll give your table saw a whole lot of respect. I decided to use my FTG blade to cut the half lap joints. This sexy red blade has a flat top grind. That is, all the ends of the teeth are ground flat, whereas the teeth of most saw blades are angled. The bottom of a conventional saw curve has a characteristic W cross section. The FTG blade, if you can find one, cuts a curve that is perfectly flat and square. Just the thing for half laps. This blade has the added advantage of cutting a kerf that is exactly one eighth of an inch wide. The ribs have bilateral symmetry, so I can set a stop block to cut one side, then just flip the workpiece around and cut the other side in the proper location. My little oscillating spindle sander is just about the cheapest and cheesiest power tool in my shop, but it kind of gets the job done. Here, it helped me to smooth the cut edges of the ribs, especially the swooping curve. The central spine is bigger than the four ribs, so although I started the cuts on the table saw in the same way, I had to finish them with a handsaw at the Roubaix bench. And here is how the spine and ribs go together. Nice, huh? Next, I'll be breaking down a sheet of quarter inch birch ply, as all the other pieces will be made from that. One of the things you don't see in the typical maker video is the maker person just sitting there thinking. I don't like making mistakes, so I invest a lot of time not cutting wood, but instead just staring at the work and thinking everything through. Other makers do that too, right? Right?
Whenever you're making multiple identical parts, it pays to create some sort of a jig, a contraption to hold the workpiece in the right position. That way, all of your parts come out the same. This simple jig is just a notch taken out of a piece of thin plywood. Now, by locking the spindle of the drill press in its intended location in the workpiece, you can easily align the jig to the workpiece. The drill bit I'm using for this operation is called a Forstner bit. It specializes in cutting larger, flat-bottomed holes in wood, and that's what I'm using to cut the holes in the ends of the hangers. But Forstner bits often tear out the surface of plywood when they exit on the back side. You can counteract this by only drilling halfway through, then flipping the workpiece over and completing the hole from the other side. When you have symmetrical pieces and a jig to hold them, it's easy. To round off the ends of the eight plywood hangers, I made a jig so I could use the disc sander. The holes in the ends of the hangers made it easy. I glued a short piece of half-inch dowel into a strategically placed hole in a small piece of plywood. Then I glued a guide onto the bottom of the plywood. The guide is a short piece of hardwood that fits precisely into the miter slot of the sander's table. Now, I've made jigs like this before, so I had some left over from a previous project. The guide is a few thousandths shallower than the miter slot, so I used a few cut-up business cards as a shim to raise it up for gluing. Now all I needed to do was place the hanger's hole over the dowel and spin it into the disc sander to get an instant rounded end concentric with the hanger's hole. <laughs> There are no metal fasteners in this lamp. It's just half lap joints held in place with glue. Now to give the glue some bare wood to stick to, I put some masking tape on the lap joints before I painted them. By design, the gray primer paint is thin and aggressive and it dries very quickly. This means that lots of paint particles bounce off the surface, dry in the air, and then settle back, but don't become part of the finish. But this leaves a gritty layer on top of the primer that you have to get rid of before you apply the finished coat. Now, I don't use steel wool because I dislike the tiny bits of metal it sheds everywhere. Instead, I use a synthetic steel wool called Merlon. It's sort of like a Scotch-Brite pad. I often use these clever little devices called painter's pyramids. They're inexpensive little plastic tetrahedrons that are used to elevate your pieces, making only minimal contact with them so they don't mess up your paint job. And by lifting objects off the table, they allow for a better air circulation when you're, when you're spray painting. My original drawing called for painting the spine and ribs a muted Dijon mustard color. Unfortunately, the only yellow I had was more like that horrible bright yellow stuff they put on ballpark hot dogs. 
Eventually, this garish yellow became too much for me, and I replaced it with a calmer color. color LEDs, especially the ones that are directly addressable. But all that flexibility means controlling and directing them effectively becomes very complex. I just want a light that will let me see what I'm doing when I'm making popcorn. So I chose some pretty vanilla warm white LEDs that come on a strip about a half an inch wide with pressure sensitive adhesive backing. I made a real beginner's error with these LEDs and it was quite a hassle to fix it. The sticky stuff on the back of these cheap LED strips is not very good, so the surface you place it on has to be perfectly smooth and utterly clean. Uh, these painted plywood strips were neither. Everything looked fine at first, but after a day or so, the LED strips began to peel off and detach from the plywood. I tried gluing them down with CA glue, but that didn't work. I think the pressure sensitive glue on the strips somehow interfered with the action of the cyanoacrylate. Then I tried adhering them with double stick tape. Once again, I think the glues interacted badly because there was just little or no stickage. Finally, I bought some clips made for these strips and that worked, although it's not pretty. The solution was good enough. I've since learned that the pressure sensitive adhesive on the better quality, more expensive LED strips is much stronger and more forgiving. I had already purchased a hefty 8.5 amp LED power supply but I did the first test with my benchtop DC power supply so I could get an accurate read on what the actual power consumption would be. I started things up with the current limiter turned way down, then slowly opened it up. The power maxed out at a little over four amps. Excellent. Before I bought the clips to hold the LED strips in place, the peeling strips made me want to make the thin plywood boards the LEDs were mounted on removable. I thought that I could use toothpicks to lock them in place. The idea had promise, but it didn't work, and besides, making LEDs removable kind of defeats one of the big advantages of LEDs. That is, they should last longer than the fixture itself does. But the little plastic clips worked fine, and so I finally just glued the boards into the fixture. There's a whole other part of this project yet to make. I need to design and fabricate some sort of a hanger that will suspend the popcorn lamp in just the right position over the popcorn popping table. 
My workshop is, is in a former hay barn, which is a very lightly built structure. I can't just put screw eyes into the ceiling, as that would put a hole in the roof. The lamp will have to hang from one of the transverse wooden trusses that hold up the roof. The trusses are 12 feet apart, and the popcorn lamp will hang somewhere in between two of them. I could have run a bar between two of the trusses and hang it from that, or I could cantilever it off of a single truss. Since the lamp is very close to one of the trusses, I chose the cantilever approach. This means the hanger has to be particularly rigid to hold the lamp rock steady. Now this hanger will be 20 feet up in the air, usually in the dark, so it's a great opportunity for good enough. It doesn't have to be beautiful, it just has to be solid and strong. So I'm gonna whip it up out of structural steel. I probably won't even bother to paint it. I'll weld the hanger up so that it fits snugly around the cord of the closest truss and attach it with several lag screws. I'll use some light duty chain to hold the fixture and I'm gonna spread the ends of the chain apart at the top to give the lamp a natural tendency to damp any oscillations.
quite a few trips up and down in the scissor lift to establish the precise position, determine the optimal height, and then cut the two chains to the exact length. It turned out that getting the lamp exactly level was one of the more challenging tasks. I attached the power supply to one of the struts on the hanger with some good quality zip ties. Then I brought mains power to it by way of some light duty electrical cord. I brought the 12 volt power down to the lamp with some number 12 speaker wire zip tied to one of the chains. This cord has clear insulation, so it's nearly invisible. Designing and building the popcorn lamp was a lighthearted and fun project. Yes, I had a practical rationale for making it, but really it was a gauze-thin excuse as a simple and cheap store-bought fixture would have done just as well. But there's a very satisfactory sense of accomplishment when you make something like this. It only took a few days to build, but for years to come, every time I make popcorn for my family and friends, we'll all get a little smile looking at this new addition to the shop. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.